Well, today's message would be a nice shift from what it's been for several months. Uh, we've been in the book of John, and we still are in the book of John. It makes it sound like we're not going to be there, but we are. Uh, but um, the shift is nice because uh, it's been really heavily focused on uh, a negative, a more negative message. Um, the people rejecting Christ, people abandoning Christ. Um, Walking away, and as we saw in John 6, uh, after Jesus fed the 5,000, the multitudes, and, and, and walked across the water, uh, all these things that we've seen, and people were following him around, and then they walked away, because ultimately what he was talking about at the end of the day, despite his miracles, was not what everyone wanted. Um, and now that Judas is out of the picture, we saw his exit last week as Jesus exposed the traitor among the, the disciples. Uh, now Jesus can do what he's been longing to do, uh, to bring comfort and uh, encouragement to these men who are going to soon be leading his ministry as he's leaving uh, the ministry, uh, his earthly ministry. Now, of course, he'll continue the, the ministry as he goes to heaven, but uh, the, the earthly ministry will, be, in a sense, be given to these men. Um, so now he's, he's going to inject a uh, hope and a sense of um, encouragement into them and a sense of purpose. Uh, even though they may not understand that purpose right away, it, they're not going to understand it until after he comes back, after he resurrects from the dead. But um, So we've been saying uh, the last, last week, especially that he had some things to say, and these are them. And we're gonna. And this is why I'm saying this is a more positive message. I've been waiting for a long time to get to this point, so we can really talk about the more positive change as we've been watching the the growing resentment towards him, uh, the opposition. Uh, now we get to see Christ and his intimate uh, relationship with these men. So we're really going to dig into that today. Um, What's interesting is though, even though Judas may have fooled, even the 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 most popular of disciples or the most discerning disciples, um, and you could argue, you can make a case against Peter about being a discerning disciple, but um, he did not fool Christ uh, because John, as John two said, um, Jesus didn't need to anyone. Jesus did not need man to tell him about. What was in man? And Jesus knows by his omniscience. And we're going to see a lot of that today. Um, so, But some people are really good at faking or being deceiving about whether they are a Christian or not. And sometimes it's not always a nefarious thing that they're trying to be outwardly wicked. But they may be themselves deceived in what they believe. And so when they come to Christ, they may be disappointed which ultimately is what we found in Judas. But these people may not be, like I said, wicked or necessarily uh, evil in a way, um, as, far as, as far as it goes, as, as uh, trying to fake it to everyone. But m most of the time what it is, is they want to fit in with the family. They, they don't want to be, they don't want to disappoint family members. They don't want to disappoint their mother or their, their father, or maybe even a, a brother or a cousin or whoever. Uh, so, but they truly think that they are Christians, and they are self-deceived, but they have no fruits that bear it, and they chase after the world. And this really applies to even preachers and teachers of the word. Some of them are well-intentioned. I think about uh, this week, um, a pastor who I've read about, um, I'm not going to mention him by name, but he had a... His suit jacket was, uh, when he turned around, there was the sweat mark on the back of his jacket. And someone took a picture and said that he had the wings of an angel on him. And, and he actually promoted this picture to say, this is how you can tell pretty much that I'm from God. And there was so many sentiments that followed after that, confirming, yes, you are, by, you are from God because and this is the proof of it. There is a way to measure if someone is from God. And that's really the kind of the question that gets answered in today's uh, service. So we're going to look at that. And a lot of people think that God works in mysterious ways. People have all sorts of methods to figure out what God is doing in their life and how God is working. But Jesus gives us a simple way to know 
if someone is of God. When you're talking to a man or a woman who claims to be a Christian, not everything that's Christian is Christian. It's because it says Christian TV or Christian radio it doesn't mean you should be listening to it. It doesn't mean you should be devouring that and putting that in your body. Uh, when I was a young believer, I used to love watching, especially a brand new believer at 30 years old, I, I loved watching all things that had the word Jesus in it because I just wanted to know more about him. But you can actually poison yourself with wrong teaching. So the answer uh, we're going to find out today is, uh, what is a true disciple and how would you know one if you met one? So we got some material to go over, so I'm not going to try and waste any more time trying to introduce this topic. This is It's pretty self-explanatory, so we're going to read the passage and see what the Lord has to say. So we're in John 13. Go ahead and open up your Bible if you haven't already, and I'll give you a second to get there. We've gotten so far all the way to verse 30. Now we're going to start in verse 31, and we're going to finish out the chapter right here. So... Jesus has just left, got the, the morsel of food, as Jesus implicated to John and Peter, that was the sign of the one who would betray him. And as Judas makes his exit, we start off in verse 31, Therefore, when he had gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified, if God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him and himself, and will glorify him immediately. Little children, I am with you a little while longer. You will seek me. And as I, as I said to the Jews, now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus said, where I go, you cannot follow me now but you will follow later. And Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you right now? I will lay down my life for you. And Jesus answered, Will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, a rooster will not crow until you deny me three times. Let's go ahead and pray real quick over this message before we really dig into it. First thing we're going to see is sacrificial love. It's right there uh, in the verse in the, this first section of verses here. Verse 13, or I'm sorry, 13, 31. Um, now is the Son of Man glorified. Now that Judas has moved on, the meeting was over. The uncomfortable meeting with Judas was over. The uncomfortable exposure with, G with Judas is over. And Judas was his friend, and they shared in, in a lot of things together. They shared in ministry, in many conversations. Think about three years of all the conversations you would have had with someone in a three-year time span. And Jesus had spent this time with him. They had sweet fellowship, as we read in Psalm 55 last week, that David said they had sweet fellowship in the house of the Lord, worshiping God together. And Jesus taught many times in the temple, and Judas was right there among them. Uh, but now, Jesus is saying, verse 31, Now is the Son of Man glorified. Now is the way, uh, the word there, and it says now is. The is really is a passive verb. Uh, it's, it's action that's already happened to the recipient prior to this. So you could read it as, now was the Son of Man glorified. And it's also, again in the verse, uh, and God is glorified. So you could say, now was the Son of Man glorified, and God was glorified. And it's referring to Judas. Judas fulfilled Scripture. That's what Jesus is saying right here off the bat. Jesus, Judas fulfilled Scripture, and so the Son of Man is glorified. That's what Jesus is saying. It's from Zechariah 11, 13. Uh, Judas fulfilled it in this way. And the Lord said to me, Throw it to the potter, that magnificent price at which I was valued. So I took the thirty she shekels of silver and threw them to the potter in the house of the Lord. And, of course, we all know that's exactly what Judas did after the, the events of tonight unfold. He get, feels guilty, feels remorse, and he goes back and he throws the, the, the 30 shekels of silver and they, they give it to the potter. They, they, give it to, they buy a field and it's the potter's field and completely fulfills Scripture. 
So Jesus is now saying, the man, son of man is glorified through that. And Judas's actions solidified the outcome. The wheels are now in motion for God's plan to continue. And Christ's sacrificial love was now locked in. And that's the first element that we're going to see, Christ's sacrificial love. It's confirmed. The path was decided a long time ago. And Judas was going to bring glory to the Son of Man in that way. But Jesus is now looking past that. And we talked a little bit about how Jesus, uh, his, uh, I think it was verse, um, sorry, this isn't in my notes, I'm skipping around here, but... Um, Verse, I don't know. this is what happens when I go off my notes. Um, well, anyway, Jesus is, he had, oh, there it is. Verse 21, when Jesus had said this, he became troubled in spirit. Jesus was troubled in, in spirit last time when he was outing the traitor. Now the traitor's gone. Now he's looking past what was about to come in the next 12 hours. Now he's looking towards the future. So he's looking at his fulfillment. Verse 31 and 32. Now is the Son of Man glorified, and, and, and God was glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself, and he will glorify himself immediately. He's talking about the cross. But he's talking about the, the glories of the cross to come. And in the near future, in Matthew 26, if you want to go ahead and turn to Matthew 26, I'm going to show you something real quick. Uh, this is kind of instrumental to this section. Jesus is looking past the cross. In the near future, in Matthew 26, he will also look past the cross. When he's talking to the Pharisees. And by the way, while you're turning there, if, if the term Son of Man confuses you, you need to know that Jesus uses the term Son of Man to refer to himself in his humanness and the Son of God in his deity. And Jesus is the only one who calls himself, or uses the phrase, Son of Man, 84 times in the New Testament. But look at how they both connect right here in Matthew 26. Matthew 26, verses 63. Jesus is talking to the high priest. The high priest says to Jesus, I adjure you by the living God, that you tell us whether you are the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus said to him, You have said it yourself. Nevertheless, I tell you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man. There's both of the terms in the same setting. Sitting, as Jesus says, at the right hand of power and the coming on the clouds of heaven. So this is the proof that he is both the Son of Man, and the Son of God. So he's looking forward, even in this time, just probably about nine or ten hours away when he's going to be grilled by the, the high priest. So now he's doing again right here. He's looking past the horrors of the cross. He's looking past of what's coming. Most of us, if we knew that we were going to be crucified the next morning, we wouldn't be thinking about the glory to come afterwards. We'd be thinking about the pain, the ripping in the part of our flesh, being nailed to a cross. That's what will be on our mind. But Jesus is not so. He's got a sovereign mind. And he's now looking past all that. He's looking past the horrors of the cross. Because it's his sacrificial love that will be pulling us out of the fire. And that's his point here. This love also means that he's going to have to go. He cannot execute the sacrificial love without going away. He has to go away. He must die this night, this day. So he's preparing them in verse 33. Back in John 13, verse 33. Little children, I am with you a little while longer. You will seek me, as I said to the Jews. Now also I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. This term, little children, this is a term of endearment these are his beloved as we learned in john uh, 13 back in the beginning of the chapter verse uh, one having loved his own who were in the world he loved them to the end or we said to the max is the literal translation he loved them as much 
as he could love them. And this is first evident in his sacrificial love right here. This is what he's saying. But he's bringing comfort to them. Because they're obviously going to be stunned by this statement. They're stunned. And the Jews are going to be stunned um, by what's to come. But we need to understand true love properly. His sacrificial love sustains us. His knowledge, the knowledge of this comforts us. Uh, 1 John 3.16 says, We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us. In that you can see John's understanding in AD 90, some 40 years later, he gets that this is what it means to love. He understands the first aspect of this, Christ's sacrificial love. And we also, and he starts to go to our next point, uh, John in uh, 1 John 3.16, we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. So that's the second point. This is the standard of love. Not only does Christ show us his sacrificial love, he shows us the standard of love. And he uses uh, the laying down of our lives, John did right there, as the example. Look at verses 34 and 35. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. We'll get to the second part of that in a second. The new commandment I give to you. We've heard this plenty of times before. This isn't necessarily a new command, but Jesus is always saying, you have heard it said, right? You have heard it said not to murder. But I tell you, if you look on someone with hate, you've already committed murder, right? Or we could say the example about adultery. If you looked on a woman with lust, you've heard it said, you should not commit adultery. But if you look on a woman with lust, you've already committed adultery in your heart. But this new commandment is like a new doctrine. It's like a new commandment in a way. But it's not new as it's replacing something. It's not better. It's not improved. This is just uh, something that's, um, and I'll give you a couple examples to, to illustrate this. Um, I don't know if you want to turn there, but Mark 1 real quick. I'm just going to go ahead and read a little bit. Listen to these two examples of, of uh, this new doctrine, this new teaching. It's not really new after all. Mark 1, verse 21 to 27. This is Jesus in the synagogue. Uh, they went into Capernaum, and immediately the Sabbath he entered the synagogue and began to teach. They were amazed at his teaching. First element right there. For he was teaching with one as having authority and not as the scribes. Just then there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, What business do we have with each other, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come here to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. Throwing him into convulsions, the unclean spirit cried out with a loud voice and came out of him. They were all amazed, so that they debated among themselves, saying, What is this, a new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. This is not new. They should know that God has sovereign power over everything. And there's nothing new about this. I mean, from the beginning of Genesis, they should know this. Adam knew it right away. That's why he hid himself in the garden. But look at the second example. That was to the Jews. So the Jews should know this. They've had the oracles of God. But now we go to Acts 17. Just real quick. Just a couple of verses, not a longer deal like that. This is There's no new revelations here. Acts 17, verses 19 and 20. This is Paul being brought before the men. And uh, this is the Areopagus. Then they took him out and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, may we, have, may we know what this new teaching is, which you are proclaiming. For you are bringing some strange things to our ears, so we want to know what these things mean. And Luke says, Now all the Athenians and the strangers visiting there used to spend their time in nothing other than telling or hearing something new. Uh, I'm not going to get wrapped up in that, but you know, let's, a, lot, a lot of guys like to just sit there and pontificate on things. Well, well, Paul went to the center of their pontificating and went to tell them, something new, something that the Jews should have been doing all along. Remember, J Jonah was told to go out to the Gentiles and preach in Nineveh so they would repent. The Jews should have been doing this all the time. They should have been preaching the word to save Gentiles. But 
now these men are hearing this stuff for the first time, and Paul is going there to tell them about Christ. So now we see to the Gentiles, there's really nothing new here. People know this, but they don't. They might not know the specifics, but, uh, for example, before I was saved, I thought I knew about Jesus. I thought I knew a few things about Jesus, but once God opened my eyes, I had a new understanding of who Jesus was. This is what it means when Jesus is saying, the new commandment I give to you. So Jesus is saying that, that you love one another. That's the second part of this. And John 15, uh, a few chapters away, will confirm this. Love one another as I have loved you. Well, how had Jesus loved them? He cared for them. He washed their feet. He protected them during the storms when they were they felt threatened. And they were, as the scripture said, they were terrified of the storms. And Jesus provided for them food. Uh, among the, the many times that he provided food, the two of them were written in scripture, 5,000 people, 4,000 people. The, the disciples always got the leftover baskets. In one case, they had 12 baskets of food. And they brought with them on the boats. Jesus cried with them, right? How had he loved him? He cried with them like when Mary and Martha lost their brother Lazarus. He was right there, compassionate with them, feeling compassion. Also, Christ fed them spiritually. In Matthew, on the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, verse 44, Jesus said, Love your enemies. You have heard it said, love your enemies. But I tell you, uh, and he was teaching them to pray, not only to love their enemies, but to pray for their enemies. He's feeding them spiritually. He's feeding their spiritual growth, their spiritual maturity. So this is the, these are the ways that Jesus has been caring for them. Of course, last but, not, last but not least, we don't want to leave out Jesus uh, caring for their eternal souls. Uh, Paul says in Ephesians 2, Walk in love just as Christ has also loved you and gave himself up for us. And all this goes back to the law in Leviticus. And Paul says the whole law is fulfilled in this word that you should love yourself, love your neighbor as yourself. Why is that so important? I mean, we all get we should be good to people. That's kind of a you know a moral thing, a cultural thing. We should be good to each other. The golden rule. I mean, most people that aren't even Christian understand this basic concept. So why is it so important that we have love for one another? Why is Jesus harping on this? Why has it come up so many times in Scripture? Because the whole law is fulfilled in this. How can the whole law be fulfilled in this? Verse 35. Standard of love is important because by this all men will know you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Christ speaks, Christ's simple actions of love will be proven that in all men that by our own common love for one another, like our master's love for us, that we come truly in his name, bearing some love, the same love as he had for mankind. Some may not ever meet a true disciple, or, or haven't really run into some, or some say that they're true disciples and they've had pretty bad run-ins, but how do they know uh, if they're really a believer or not? If you have an, un, an unbelieving Christian or an unbelieving person who doesn't claim to be Christian, running into a person who is a Christian or says they're a Christian, how do they know whether they really are? I said in the beginning, not everything that is Christian is Christian. How, do you, how can you tell the difference? When we hear the stories in the Gospels, we assume everyone knew who Peter and Paul and, and John and James were. And maybe they got to know them after a while, but they didn't know them right away, but they could tell by one way. And Christ says, you'll be known by your love for me, or I'm sorry, the, your love for each other. Likely the people knew all the rumors about Christ, the healing, the compassion, the blind see, the, the, the lame walk, the prostitutes were forgiven, even ta tax collectors were loved. Likely today all people know our poor experiences they've had with so-called Christians. So the question on the table is, how can someone know if they're talking to a real disciple? Acts 4 shows us a pretty good example of that. 
Neil has a turn there. I'm just going to go through it real quick. Just listen to this. Acts 4.32. And the congregation of those who believed were of one heart and soul. This is talking about believers. This is what the outside world would see. And the congregation of those who would believe were of one heart and soul, and not one of them claimed that anything belonging to him was his own, but all things were common property to them. And with great power the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord, and abundant grace was upon all of them, them all. For there was not a needy person among them. For all who were owners of houses or land would sell them and bring the proceeds and this of the sales and lay them at the apostles' feet. And they would be distributed to each each as any had need. We're talking about doing programs in the church at some point down the road where we have something similar. Where people can, this is just an idea, and I'm probably way ahead of us actually implementing. But these are the things that we're going to be talking about in the coming weeks. Where we can have people bring things that work, of course, but that we can give away. To people who have need, just come, if you need it, just come take it. So come get it. And just help each other to become like this, this church that was growing in the first century where, where they were just giving to each other for, for freely. And this is how they're known. Christ says the standard is love. We may be the only Christian that people meet. Look, the truth of the word that we preach is important. And you've seen that in Paul's writing, and even here, the teachings that the, the apostles were giving. That's true. But it's confirmed by the love that we display. Someone asks you, are you a Christian? How do you prove it? You can just say, well, why don't you follow me around for a little bit? I mean, that may not be practical, but after a while, they would get to kind of know. As a matter of fact, uh, one of the things, I don't know, uh, when, I, when I met Melinda, um, we talked at first, and she was, uh, I don't know if you guys know this or not, but she was, I thought she was too Pentecostal, and she thought I was too Baptist, so we didn't want to talk anymore. And we didn't, for a year, for a year. And, and, but we were friends on Facebook, and I, I saw, I, I saw her witness. I saw that she wasn't someone who was randomly posting all of her Hey, you know, oh, guess what happened to me today? I, you know, I didn't see any of that. So I thought, you know, maybe we should, maybe we should try talking again. Her, her witness, her love was bearing out. And so the truth of her faith played out for me. By your love for one another. This is how all men will know that you are my disciple. This is what Christ is saying. This is the standard for love. And love can be a hard topic topic to grasp. There's so many different opinions on what love is, what it means. And some people say, well, if you can, if you tell someone the truth that, that they're doing something wrong, that's unloving. I don't necessarily disagree. It depends on, I do agree and I don't agree with it. It just depends on the situation. But we're not here to talk about different situations and different viewpoints. We're here to talk about Christ's viewpoint. And Christ says, the standard of love, first of all, my love is sacrificial, and I am the standard of love, and all men will know that you are my disciples when you display my love for each other. But also, lastly, Christ's love is sovereign. Jesus' standard for love goes right by Peter in verse 36. Peter speaking for the group, likely. He usually did that. And most of us at that point would have been focused on uh, Jesus' departure as well. So verse 36, Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus answered, where I go, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow later. Notice Jesus responds with sovereignty. Where I go, you cannot follow me now. And Peter is busy, busy formulating his answer because of the indefinite time frame there. But Jesus is responding to his stubbornness with sovereign love. 
if you find yourself in a spot where you, you know, you're you up against a wall, you're having a tough trial, Lord, how do we get through this? And, Jesus, and this is where the apostles are right now, right? They just got told that I'm going away and you can't come with me. What do you do? You go to, to the Lord in prayer. Lord, what's going on here? I don't know what to do. And it seems like you're not getting much back. Guess what? You're getting God's sovereign love. Sometimes we call this tough love in our, in our, in our world, but This was the same thing that Jesus told the Jewish leaders in John 7. Why is that important? I mean, the, the Jewish leaders are not the apostles. I mean, but that's that's the thing to look at there. To them, it was a permanent thing. Their rejection of him would soon become permanent. When he told them, where I go, you can't follow. They will seek him, but they won't find him. And to the, to the apostles, to the disciples, he's telling them, you can't come now. But you got to trust in my sovereign plan. you got to trust in my sovereign control and, and my sovereign love that I will do what I say I will do. When I tell you that you will come later, you will come later. And we're going to see that play out. And, and first, and look at and the, the next, you could just look at the next ver, or two verses. In John 14, verse 2, just a couple of verses away, and we're not going to, really flesh this out, but in my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. Another sovereign, loving action from Christ to his disciples. And it's true that the barrier for them is not permanent like the Jewish leaders, but they're up against a tough wall right now. And they need to understand God's sovereign love. To the Jewish leadership, the Savior's sacrificial love was not extended to them. The standard of the Savior's love was not abiding in them. And the Savior's sovereign love wasn't covering them. Remember, we said, they will seek. Christ said, you will seek me, but you will not find me. So these things don't pertain to them. But Peter, with all his bravado, like many of us, Lord, if you do this, I'll do X, Y, or Z, right? If you answer my prayer in this way, I'll start doing this. This is what Peter's saying, in a sense. Look at verse 37. Lord, why can I not follow you right now? It's kind of bartering with him there, right? I will lay down my life for you. But Peter's about to get a second dose of his omniscient love, his sovereign love. It covers us even when we don't even know it. Luke fills in a few gaps for us. Luke 22. If you would turn there for just a second. Well, you don't have to turn there. Uh, I'll just read it to you. Um, listen to what Luke says in Luke 22 about this conversation that Jesus is having with Peter. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And you, once, when, once you when once you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Wait, was Satan allowed to sift him like wheat? I mean, Jesus, you didn't stop him. Look at what Jesus says. Verse 38. Will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, a rooster will not crow until you deny me three times. The question was, was Satan allowed permission? Seems like he was. Luke 22, John 13. Looks like a yes to me. But this was not punishment for Peter's bravado. This was God's sovereign love. Look, I know you're having a hard time with this, Peter. I'm going to let you understand that you're going to go through some rough times. But back in Luke 22, he kind of tells them a little bit more of the plan, right? When you come out of it, my sovereign love is going to sustain you through this. I have prayed for you. 
And when you come back again, I want you to strengthen the brothers. So three times our Lord used his sovereign love to comfort his disciple. And I think this extends out to all of us. Maybe not in this specific uh, way, like I'm going to say here in a second with Peter, but God's love, sovereign love, should bring comfort to us when we're trying, we're up against a wall, we're facing a hardship. God's telling us his sovereign love covers us. First one, you will deny me, he says. John 18, 27, that actually happened. And also Jesus says, you will return to your faith to strengthen your brothers. John 21, they're sitting on the beach. Guess what Jesus was doing? Recommissioning Peter back into the ministry where Peter felt like he wasn't or shouldn't be doing it after he had the failure of denying Christ three times. And then finally, uh, back in verse uh, 36, the end of the verse, where I go, you cannot follow me. Listen to this next part, but you will follow later. History shows that Peter did follow Christ in the same way and was actually crucified just like his Savior. Although he chose to be crucified upside down because he didn't feel like he was worthy to be crucified in the same manner as his Lord. So all this is to show the sovereign love, the sovereign control of Christ. Jesus tells them why this is important later in John 15. You did not choose me, but I chose you. But why? That you would go and bear fruit. It's important for us to understand why, to understand these three aspects of our Savior's love. First, his love is sacrificial, as we've been saying. His love is the standard. And also his sovereign love. And if we are to bear fruit and add souls to the kingdom, if we are to be a missional church, congregation, group of believers, whatever you want to call us, then we need to understand these things. We need to understand that God is in control. I'm going to read to you guys real quick. This is I'm, we'll, we'll close with this. Um, this is a, an interesting story because if we are going to be going out and uh, helping snatch people from the flames, as Jude puts it. Um, I think it's, under, it's very important to understand this, and this is a pretty cool story that kind of sums it all up. Listen to this. A missionary preached to a group of Indians, telling them that Jesus Christ, God in human flesh, had voluntarily died for their sins. The old Indian chief was very moved by Christ's sacrifice and decided to do something for the Lord Jesus. So he rose to his feet and walked up to the missionary, laid his tomahawk at the missionary's feet and said, Chief, give his tomahawk to Jesus. Then he went back and sat down. The missionary, sensing that the Holy Spirit was working on the chief, started preaching again. This time he told the Indians that God, in giving us Jesus, had given us his absolute best. The chief listened carefully, considering the matter, and then walked forward again, this time carrying his blanket. He laid the blanket at the missionary's feet and said, Chief, give his blanket to Jesus. But that still wasn't the response the missionary was looking for, so he started preaching again. He told the Indians how Jesus, even though he was rich in heaven, had become poor for us by being born in a manger, living a humble life, and dying by the way of a cruel, humiliating cross. This compelled the chief to leave the meeting, go get his horse, bring the animal to the missionary, and say, Chief, give his horse to Jesus. Now the chief thought to himself, I have given everything to Jesus, who gave himself for me. The missionary, however, started up yet another round of preaching. This time he explained that Jesus had risen from the dead, appeared to many in his post-resurrection body, ascending to heaven 40 days later, and was now seated at the right hand of his heavenly Father for men and women to bring men and, men and women to himself. And it was then that the chief finally understood why the missionary had never seemed satisfied with these fine gifts. The chief stood up again, walked forward, bowed himself at the missionary's feet, and said, Chief, give himself to Jesus. And that's the point. That's the point. To be a missional church, we need to understand Christ's love as sacrificial. And his love is the standard for us to love each other. And then others will know that we're 
Christ. So it's not only that we preach the right word and like the preaching of the missionary, but to show the love to one another. And when it's tough, when it's tough and times are hard, then we fall back on God's sovereign love and sovereign control. Let's pray together.